I've recently been working on a Minecraft ray tracer. I built it from the ground up to render images on the CPU using just the available information about the blocks surrounding the player. I've put a lot of effort into making it fast, but you'll still notice that the frame times are measured in seconds. It'd be nice to get that time down further, but either way, I've learned a fair bit about how ray tracing works on a technical level during the process of building this thing. So today I'll be teaching you about it. If we use it to render the current scene that I'm looking at, it looks pretty decent, even though this is only really a bare bones ray tracer. I'm sure most of the people watching this video already know at least a bit about ray tracing, but here's a quick refresher. Let's say you have a virtual world made up of 3D objects that you want to render into an image. The most common way to do it is using a technique called rasterization. Each object is made of triangles, and we use some simple math to translate the position of the triangles from the 3D space of the world to the 2D space of the screen. From there, we can use a bunch of cool tricks to get things like lighting, shadows, and reflections without much of a performance impact. Ray tracing is a different way of rendering graphics, where for every pixel, we send out a ray into the world and see what object it hits. This object changes the color of the ray, and the ray bounces off of it, and goes on to potentially hit another object which also changes the colour a bit. And so on and so forth, until either the ray bounces off into space or reaches some maximum allowed number of bounces. The basics of it are very simple, and the images it produces can look absolutely breathtaking. But the cost is that it takes a lot more computing power. And I'm sure I'll get at least one comment pointing out that I'm technically path tracing, which is more complicated than simply ray tracing. With all that out of the way, let's get started. I'm using Mindflayer as a Minecraft client. This lets us connect to a multiplayer world and gives us a player that can be controlled through code, and will act as our camera. Mindflayer gives you access to a function called Blocker that takes a position vector and gives you back the block that's in that position in the world. The rays will all start out at the position of our camera with the color white, and will send out rays in a range of directions depending on the camera direction and the field of view. A ray needs to travel in that direction until it hits a block. We do this in a loop of first checking for a block at the position of the ray, and then stepping the ray along in its specific direction. To check if a block is empty, we just need to check if it's either air or cave air. That's right. Minecraft has two types of air blocks, regular air and cave air, which is found in caves. They both look like nothing, but Minecraft insists on treating them as separate things. So it needs to be accounted for in the code. Moving on. In case you were wondering, the direction is a little vector that represents an offset. So you might think to make the ray take a step, we just need to add our direction vector to our position vector. But well, no actually, not exactly. The problem with our current approach is that it's possible for a ray to miss the corners blocks when it takes a step. If we shrink the length of our direction vector, we'll take smaller steps and it will reduce the amount that it happens but it means we need to do more steps to travel the same overall distance, which makes it slower. Another solution, which I'm using and found in this paper, is to look at the boundaries between blocks for the different axes and step to the nearest one in the direction of our ray. This entirely eliminates the issue with skipping the edges of blocks and is also quite fast. When a ray hits a block, just like in real life, we want the block to absorb some of the color from the ray. For now, I'll keep things simple and say each block has a single color. Colors are represented by RGB values stored in vectors ranging from 0 to 1. Remember, I said rays start with the color white, which means its vector would be all 1s. A white block would have the same RGB values, while a black block would have all zeros. Gray is somewhere in between, so its RGB values would be something like 0.5 in every channel. If a block was pure red, green, or blue, it would have one of these corresponding vectors. Purple blocks would have a combination of red and blue. In order to simulate how light is absorbed by a block, we need to multiply the color of our ray by the color of the block. With just this simple process, it's already possible to construct a rudimentary image. Keep in mind, we're sending out one ray for each pixel in the image, so about 2 million rays in total for a 1080p image and the color of each pixel is going to be determined by the first block its ray hits, since we aren't doing any bounces yet. There's also a sky color that's given to rays that don't hit a block. And here's our first image. You can kind of make out some trees and maybe some boulders, but all the blocks kind of melt together into these weird blobs of color. 
making it hard to tell what's going on beyond a vague understanding that this is probably some kind of forest. Now that our wraiths have done their main job of giving us colour information, you might think we can throw them away to be dealt with by the garbage collector. But we can also use the available data in our wraiths to make another type of image based on how far each ray travelled. This is called a distance map, and we can use it to add fog to our images. All I'm doing is using it as a mask to blend between the block colours and a fog colour based on how far the ray travelled at any specific position. And the result is a much clearer picture. You can see the shapes of the individual trees and get a pretty good understanding of the terrain and how far away some things are. This distance fog technique was used by a lot of games back in the day for its low computation cost and surprisingly good visuals, and is still used in some games today like Animal Crossing and even Minecraft itself. Although most big budget games these days probably use some sort of volumetric fog, which can look more realistic but requires a lot more computing power. Moving on to something a little more abstract, another important aspect of rendering we need is normal vectors. A normal vector works just like our direction vector. When one of our rays hits a block, the normal vector tells us which direction that part of the block is facing. So if the ray hits the top of a block, the normal vector points up. Right side points to the right, left side to the left, you get the idea. It can be useful for a bunch of different things, but it can't really be directly applied to an image the same way that distance can. Each ray ends up with its own normal vector, so it's still possible to make an image by assigning a unique colour to each of the six possible directions, but these colours are kind of arbitrary and don't help us render a more realistic image. One thing we can actually use it for is a super cheap lighting effect. In our case, we're not actually going to be using it for the final product, since our goal here is 100% ray traced graphics. But it's a neat trick, so I wanted to talk about it. First, we define a sun direction. Then, when a ray hits a block, we get the dot product between the normal and the sun direction, and use that to determine how bright the colour should be. So our surface gets brighter, the more it aligns with the direction of the sun. If we take our simple colour-only approach and apply this technique for shading, everything becomes a lot clearer. This is another trick that was common in games in the past to get fairly good-looking results without much computing power. As far as I'm aware, it's actually still pretty common, usually in combination with another algorithm that draws the shadows. Of course, to fully appreciate it, we should add the fog back in. But that's a little overpowering, so I think it's better if we dial it down a bit. The next thing we want to do is add textures to the blocks. I have a folder containing all the block textures that I got by extracting them out of the game files. Unless that violates Minecraft TOS. In which case, I got them in a completely different way that doesn't do that. Anyway, when a ray hits the side of a block, we need to map the location it hits to a point on the texture. The ray position has three components, while the position on the image only has two components. So to convert the ray position into the texture position, we need to pick which of these components to use. It's going to depend on which side of the block the ray hits, but we can use the normal vector to figure it out without too much hassle. From here, there's the tiny complication of getting the colour of the pixel from the texture buffer. You see, when I load an image into memory, it's in what's called a buffer. It's like a big list of all the colour data from every pixel of the texture. For example, the first three values in the buffer are the RGB of the first pixel, and the fourth value is its transparency, which we aren't using yet, but it is there when we need it. The next four values are for the second pixel, this pattern continues for the entire image. We could rearrange the data to be a bit more convenient, but we can actually get the index of any pixel quite easily. So it's actually fine to leave it as a buffer. And in fact, it might actually be better for performance than something like nested arrays. Taking another stab at rendering an image, we get some pretty strange results. We can also try temporarily adding back our shading and fog effects too. At this point, I think it's starting to look really interesting. Almost like something you'd find in an indie horror game. But as much as I like this eerie aesthetic, we aren't done yet. If we want the ray tracer to accurately model the behaviour of light, we're going to need to make some adjustments. Firstly, as some of the comments on my video about dithering pointed out, the colours that are stored in an image don't really represent amounts of light. 
They're stored in sRGB, which distorts brightness values to better match human vision, but makes computations inaccurate unless we convert them to a linear space. This means the perceived difference between things like brightness becomes nonlinear. In order to fix this, we can square the values to make them linear RGB. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's the basic idea. There's still a lot missing from our ray tracer. Actual shadows, reflections, and emissions all come to mind. To make a proper lighting simulation, we need to expand our rays to be more sophisticated. Since we're doing everything backwards and having our rays come from the camera rather than being emitted by the lights. First, in addition to a ray's colour, we'll also need to keep track of how much light the ray has received. To allow blocks to emit light, they need a colour to emit and the strength of the emission. An important distinction here is between the colour of the block we're getting from the texture and the colour that it emits, which can be different. The colour of a block that's used for absorbing light is called its albedo, and the colour it's emitting is the emission colour. When a ray bounces off a block, we need to start by taking the light that's being emitted by the block, which is the colour it's emitting scaled by the strength of the emission. We multiply it by the colour of the ray, and add the result to the ray's incoming light. Then we need to simulate the light the block's absorbing, which means multiplying the ray's colour by the block's albedo. To finish it off, we multiply the ray's colour by the dot product between the normal vector and the ray's direction, which simulates the difference in the amount of light reflected depending on the angle in which it hits the surface. After we've done those calculations, we can alter the direction of the ray to simulate a bounce. The easiest way to do it is to treat the blocks as if they have a really rough surface. So the ray will bounce off in a random direction. To prevent the ray from entering the block, I'm performing an extra step of inverting the ray's direction if its dot product with the normal vector is negative. At the end of all of this, the colour the ray returns is going to be its incoming light. Sometimes a ray is going to travel off into the sky after a bounce, or sometimes without a bounce at all. And not only do we need to account for it, but we're actually betting on the sky to be the primary source of light in most cases. When this happens, we're going to need a function to get the environment light the ray would receive. The simplest thing I could do is return white, but with the direction of the ray, we could sample from a skybox. Or in this case, I went for a procedural sky based on the one used in this fantastic video that I've linked in the description. Once we have the environment light, it's multiplied by the ray's colour and added to the ray's incoming light. Now that we have emissions and a potentially very bright sun, we have the issue that it's possible for the colour values to be outside the range of 0 to 1. Values can now technically range anywhere from 0 to infinity, which is going to be an issue for any image we want to display on most monitors, which don't quite have that much range. What we need now is a way to convert our 0 to infinity range back to the range of 0 to 1. This is called tone mapping, and there are a bunch of different ways of doing it. But one simple method that's quite common is to take our value and divide it by itself plus 1. So the larger a number is, the closer you'll get to 1, but you'll never quite get there unless the value is infinite. Again, there are a lot of ways of doing it, but this is a simple one that works okay. It's been a few minutes since the last time we rendered an image, so let's try again with all the changes. As you can see, it's completely broken. The issue is that when a ray bounces off of a block, its direction becomes random and the resulting colour is going to change from pixel to pixel. This is called noise, and it's something all the major ray tracing systems have to contend with. If we render the same view twice, the image will be different because the rays bounce differently each time. If we combine them into a single image using simple averaging, we get a slightly less noisy image. It's not much, but it is an improvement. This new image would be described as having two samples per pixel. But if we were to instead render out and combine four images, the result would be four samples per pixel, since for each pixel we average the values of four different rays. The result is even less noisy than the two samples per pixel image. The more samples we take, the less noisy our final image becomes. So, hypothetically, we could just keep increasing the number of samples until we get a nice, crisp image. So, continuing up from 4 samples per pixel and doubling each time, we get 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256. 
I hope YouTube's compression didn't completely butcher all that. Now that we've got a functional ray tracer, there's one more thing I want to talk about, and that's exposure. It's a pretty fundamental concept in the world of computer graphics. And photography for that matter. Take for example the exposure of this video. You can increase its exposure by giving it a like and sharing it with a friend that you think might find it interesting. It's also possible for you to decrease the exposure of the video. But I'm not going to tell you how to do that. But seriously, exposure is a measure of how much light is in our image. More exposure means the image is brighter, and less exposure means the image is darker. With a real camera, there's a bunch of settings you can adjust to change the exposure, like the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Since the ray tracer doesn't have any of these settings, I'm instead cheating a little bit by multiplying the amount of light we measured from the rays just before it gets tone mapped. This image doesn't really showcase emissions all that well, so I'm switching over to this location where there's no sunlight getting in. Under a white light, these white walls reflect white light. This block has a blue albedo, meaning it only reflects blue light, and unsurprisingly appears blue. But if we turn the light green, the walls also turn green, but the block appears black because it absorbs the green and there's no blue light for it to reflect which is true to how light behaves in real life. On the other hand, if we make it so the block emits blue light, it combines with the green on the walls and turns them cyan. I'll have some more images in the GitHub repo for anyone that's curious, along with the code. I've also been working on rendering block entities too. Because surprise, not all blocks in Minecraft are shaped like cubes. And that probably deserves its own video at some point. At least for now, it doesn't work entirely the way that it should, and there's some other bugs that I need to fix. So in the time being, maybe you should watch another video. Next time, I'll be going over the technical details on optimizing the code for the ray tracer. Anyway, thanks for watching.